Welcome to RP Gamepire. I'm David. Thank you for joining me in this how to play video of Snowdonia, the deluxe master set. Now there's a lot of pieces that come in the master set. I'm only going to be going over how to play the introductory scenario in the wool set. Now we also have a few other videos, two other videos. Uh, one is a playthrough and a review. But right now we're going to focus on setting up the game, which uh, it's going to save you a lot of time, because like me, if you've never played Snowdonia before, it could be intimidating seeing all these pieces and you saw all the cards that came with it. Uh, it took me a while to figure out what cards to use and how to set it up. Uh, but if you've already played Snowdonia, you're probably not watching this video anyway. So uh, the first thing I want to point out is that when you look at the rule, rule book, it's going to show the this side of the board. Now you can use either side, but one thing I figured out is you want to play with the original side because the rules will refer to things like the order of the days here going from uh, this direction. If you play the other side of the board, it actually goes from top to bottom, which I can't flip over to show you. So uh, right now the board's in disarray because I want to show you how to uh, sort out the cards depending on the number of players uh, that you'll be playing with. because. The way the game works is you've got to remove certain cards depending on the number of players that you have. Uh, I'm going to show you what cards you are given for up to five players, but I'm only going to be setting it up for a two-player game. So the first step is, it says here in the rule book, I'm going to be going in order. So if you want to follow along, I'm going to start out with step one, the game board. Again, I recommend that you use the other side of the board. And then now we're going to do the rail route station cards. So what are, what are those? Here are the rail route station cards. By the way, I should point out the object of the game for context if you didn't know. Uh, we're starting here from uh, the bottom of a peak, which is, if I could pronounce it correctly, Lanberis, and we have to go all the way around the board, going up the peak, is simulating, this is an actual event in real life to the peak of Snowden. I guess there's a, a, a hotel up there, if I remember from the rule book. Let's see. Uh, yeah, the, the Mountain Tram Road and Hotels Company Limited has been formed to build a branch line from Landbaris to the summit. So this is uh, actually based on a real event. So to go up the summit, you've got to have train stations along the way. So that's what we're going to set up first. So you'll see here that you're actually have a couple cards here that say five and three to five. So if you're only playing with four or less players, you won't use this card. This one will go out. But since we're playing with only two players, we're also not going to use this card either. So the cards you are going to use are these. So let me show you those. And you'll notice here in the right-hand corner, it's sequential. So you got to see there's a one here, a three, because we had to take out the two, a four, a five, a six, and a seven. And again, if you want to see the ones that we took out, we took out the two, and the 4.5 for a two-player game. Again, you would stick this, stick these in there depending on the number of players that you have. So another thing that uh, the card you need, need to pay attention to is that you're going to put these on the board spread out, and you're going to be putting rail lines. Uh, these cards, where rubble is going to be on it because you've got to clear the rubble of the mountain, and then when you clear the rubble, you'll be turning it over to build the, the track. So how many of these cards you put to the left is indicated here. So you're going to put two cards to the left when you lay down the card. So here, let me demonstrate. Okay, so I take my deck of cards that I have, depending on the number of players, and from Lanberis, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. So I know that I, I need to put it here and leave space for two of these rubble cards. This one's going to need about a space of two. Another space of two, a space of one, 
space of three, and a space of two. Now, I'm going to probably need to spread these out even more. So let me bring these down a little bit so they're in the camera. So according to the setup rules, let me show that here. We just completed this step here of the rail route station cards. Now we're going to uh, do the rail route track cards. And so now you uh, look at what you're given here. You have a, a complete deck of rail route tra uh, track cards. And some, it says that you don't need to, you could play with these if you want to or not uh, for variety, but we're not going to include these for the basic game. So this is, I'm going to take these out, the 0, 6, and 7. Here you see you have cards numbered 4, 2, 5, 3, and you shuffle them up. So you've got to shuffle them in a way that you don't see what they are. And then I'm going to place them to the left of the uh, rail route station cards, or the station cards. So let's take a look here. So again, I've got to place two cards here to the left, according to that number earlier. So I'm placing them randomly. So there's a two and a four. See, remember I told you I would be having to move them. This one also gets two cards. Let's just slide this down. This one gets two. This one gets one. This one gets three. And this one gets two. So you'll see that there'll be a couple cards you don't use uh, randomly. They're decided to randomly pulled from the deck. So let me uh, take off the picture and picture here so you can see the complete setup here. So I'll move it down so you can see it. So you have the last rail station which simulates being at the top of the summit. Yeah, I'm just putting them in, in uh, camera here so you can see it better. All right, so now I've set up the train stations with the uh, railway route track cards, basically, which is going to have rubble on it. So you'll see right here I have a whole bunch of rubble. This simulates that this, you know, this is a worker placement game, that you are having to remove rubble as you build the train up the summit and you're building stations along the way and you've got to clear the rubble uh, for the station before you can build the next track. So if I, how does this make sense logically? You start here at the bottom of the summit. There's going to be two rubble here that need to be removed. Four rubble here. Again, this is based on the number on the card. So if it says a three, you put three rubble on it. But on the train station card, so wherever you see the shovel, this is going to get four rubble and two rubble. So six rubble is going to need to be removed in total before you can get to the next route, uh, the, ne the next track. So I put four here, two on this space. You don't mix them up because it does matter later on as to who gets to place their ownership markers as to uh, who uh, can have ownership of that station. So again, I keep on going around. This one gets two. Yeah, I'm looking at the shovels on the station card. Two, five. Again, this goes a lot faster when you have someone helping you. This one gets four. And so rubble needs to be cleared before you can build. You're going to do is flip it over, and then you can build the rail line here using steel bars that are here, and you'll get victory points if you do that. I'll cover that in a little bit here. So three goes here, four. So this is going to change every scenario as to which uh, rubble cards, you know, rail uh, track cards are going to go down. But the stations will remain the same, unless you're playing a different scenario. Again, we're playing the basic scenario. And if, as you saw on the, in your master set, there's a ton of other scenarios that you can play. Now, I haven't looked at those yet, but I assume that it's going to have different uh, stations 
and engines, which you'll see here in a moment. All right, so you'll see that I've placed all the rubble on here. There's leftover rubble, which gets removed from the game because, again, depending on the cards that were pulled, if you were playing with the six and seven, you're going to need extra rubble. Or if you were playing with these other station cards for five players, you would need more rubble for that. So this rubble is removed. So now we've set up what we're developing. You know, we're going up the mountain. Going to remove the rubble, lay the tracks, develop the stations, and that's when the game will end. It's when you finally lay the last track up the mountain. There's a couple other ways you can end as well, which I'll go over here soon. So let's take a look at what, where we're at now. So we've got our track cards, we've got our rubble on the cards and on the stations. Start player, it says here, you determine it based on whatever uh, order you, uh, way you want to do it in. You could be rolling a die or whoever read the rules. So uh, right now, I've, the green player is going to go first. Remember, we're setting up for a two-player game. Here's the pink player. And you'll see what you do with those workers here in a moment. So actually, that gets to our player pieces. So each person gets their workers and their ownership markers. Uh, you'll see, for instance, that there are 16 ownership markers per player, three workers. They're only going to have access to two of them. One of those workers for each player is going to go on the pub, which can be hired later when you get an engine, which I'll explain in a moment. You're also going to be placing each player's surveyor. This is a special piece that you'll move around the board as your surveyor goes from station to station, surveying the mountain. And the thing about that is to remember is that you don't have to have the rail lines up uh, developed yet, your sur surveyor can go ahead regardless if the rubble has been removed or not. But both surveyors for each player starts at the bottom of the summit right here. So I'll put it face down so you can see it a little bit better. So that's where each player's piece goes. And so what we've now covered there on the setup rules is five laborers and six surveyors. So we turn it over here. Now we're going to do the action overlay cards. Now this is Again, it can take some effort to figure out what is being asked of you in the setup rules. So you'll see right now that there's already action cards pre-printed pre on the board. So if you're playing a, a three or four player game, there are well, actually a three player game, it's already set up for you for a three player game. But since we're setting up for a two player game, Let's take a look at what cards you're going to be removing. Well, first off, you're not going to need any card here labeled with a 3, 3 to 5, or 4, 4 to 5, or 5. So these will be removed. They're not used. And some of them can be double-sided, but we don't use those. So those go out, but we find the ones that are labeled 1 to 2. Notice it has an A here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and notice they're all within the range of two players. So what you do is you overlay it. Even though this one right here matches the card, I'm just going to B matches what's on the board. I'm still going to put the card down just to demonstrate. So D goes over D, E. So what are these cards? Well, this is where you're going to be placing your laborers, these pieces here to carry out your worker placement actions. So this is where most of the action occurs. So when you put down a labor, you're going to carry out the action, and that's where you're going to manipulate the rail route as, you're develop as the game is developed. And soon, and you'll also be able to do stuff here as well, which I'll explain in a moment. All right, so next, we've done the action area overlay. Now 10 is game markers. So that's where you see here on the very, this is on the other side of the board, a little shovel and a little rail uh, track piece. Let me show it to you underneath the camera here so you can see. Really cool pieces. So uh, where do you find it on the original board here? Well, it's right here. So you're going to put the shovel on two. 
which indicates that if you take an excavation action, you can remove two rubble from around the board, but it's going to go in order. You can't jump ahead and remove rubble. You'll start here to remove rubble. And then you also put the, the uh, track card, I'm sorry, the track piece, what do they call it here? Lay track work rate marker over here on the one. So this means that when you uh, lay track, take this action, and the rubble's been removed, and if you have a steel bar, you can develop this uh, track here, and you turn in your, your one bar, and you put your ownership marker, and it'll be worth two points. But first you've got to remove the rubble, have a steel bar, you know, and take the action here to do that, which I'll go over here again in a moment. So now we've laid the, uh, the work rate track right here with the shovel. That means how much you can, rubble you can excavate. And then the, uh, the lay track work rate. How many tracks can you lay? So it can go up to, we can remove four rubble, which you'll see how this is changed by the weather, or even up to two lay track rates. So if you have two steel bars, you can lay two tracks if the rubble has been cleared from those areas. Uh, but again, those would be affected by the weather. We could also go down to one and one if the weather is really bad. And if it's uh, fog, you don't even get to do the action at all, which again, I'll explain here when we get to weather. Okay, so 11. Step 11 is the contract cards. So this is a key uh, aspect of the game. Contract cards, you're going to acquire, and if you get ownership markers or you lay so much track or get so much rubble, you can get victory points. So this is the victory point part, and this is the action part that goes with the associated letter. If you put a worker there, and you can decide to use the card. So if I were to put a worker uh, on A, according to this card, I can use it when it comes time to uh, taking your actions on the A spot. But again, I'll cover that later, but I just want to explain that contracts is a key part of getting victory points. But you can also get victory points up uh, Laying, track, uh, laying tracks, which you can get here, and developing stations, and removing rubble from stations. Because the object of the game is to get the most victory points. And you're going to do that by getting contracts, by uh, removing rubble from stations, and by laying track after the rubble has been removed. And by getting your surveyor up the mountain, which uh, I should point out now, on these cards here. You see at the very top right here, if you have your surveyor there, it's worth one point. And uh, we'll, we'll cover how you take a surveyor action here in a moment. But if you, if you look at the last station, if you get your surveyor all the way to the end, at the top of the summit, it's worth 21 points. So again, that's another way to get uh, victory points. But here we are on step 11 so contractor cards so like with the other cards some cards will be removed depending on the number of players so they say that in a two-player game you'll remove if you look at the very bottom here you will remove cards 20 and 29 now it says to look for three to five but for some reason it doesn't say that they're on card 28 but it does tell you remove 28 and 29 in a two-player game so i've done that so I remove those cards. I take the deck here. Notice you'll have different weather. Uh, here's daylight or sun. The sun is out. Rain and fog. I guess in that, some scenarios you have snow, which you don't play with in the basic scenario. So you shuffle them up. So I shuffle them up. I put them down here on the pile. Now it doesn't matter what order you go in. So the one goes here. Now whatever two is, you see that it's a rain symbol. It could have been this, a fog or a sun, but whatever that goes in the two spot right here, you're going to put that weather symbol right here, which means it's going to rain uh, 
a day from now. And then where it goes in the third spot, in this case, it's the sun's going to come out, which is ideal conditions to work, will go in the third position. So two days from now, it's going to be sunny again. Unfortunately, it's going to rain again on the third day. So we know that it's going to rain a day from now, right here. It's going to be sunny two days from now, and three days from now it's going to rain again. Now why should you care? Because it's going to affect your work rate, how much, you can, uh, how much rubble you can excavate, and how much track you can lay. So this is going to go up and down depending on the weather. So now we've uh, done the weather forecast. Notice you're not playing with the snow. Now trains. Now this is where it's interesting about this game thematically. It's not a game where you're moving trains around, but you're going to use trains to do work because this takes place in the late 1800s. They didn't have the back hose, you know, the caterpillar equipment that they do now. But they, as you were building the train, I'm sorry, the tracks, a train would follow behind to, to do to, to, uh, haul uh, material or haul away material. So the train was kind of like your, your, uh, your caterpillar equipment that we have today. So it says here that you're going to use the seven trains in the basic scenario, and you're going to uh, take six of those seven. And by the way, how do I find these cards? You want to get cards that have this SD symbol for the first scenario. So you'll notice that right here on the train cards, you're going to have the ST symbol right here in the left hand corner. Some scenarios will have a different symbol. And you'll see here on the player aid, depending on what scenario you're playing, you're going to need to pay attention to what happens in that scenario and depending on what cards you, you use. So that's one thing I had to figure out is make sure you have the train, the engine cards with the right symbol here in the left hand corner. And you'll notice that even on the setup cards that go around the board that you use for your worker actions will also have that symbol. So different scenarios may have different worker uh, cards uh, depending on the scenario. So we're using the SD cards. Probably should have said that first, but again, I'm going in the order of the, of the rules here, and the rules don't mention that fact until you get to step 12. So uh, back to this, I take my seven cards, I shuffle them up, and I basically going to remove one. So we take a look now at what the anatomy of these engine cards here real quick. At some point in the game, you're going to be able to get an engine. It's going to, this is going to cost one steel bar. If you keep this engine, because there's ways to lose it, you can only have one at a time. It, this one will be worth nine victory points. It's the only one in the deck, I believe, that is worth points like that. It will give you a coal when you acquire it, so you'll see I'll be putting a coal resource on the card. So this is how you're going to get your third worker. So you're going to acquire the engine. It will go down in your player area. It will come with a coal. And if you have any other coal that you've acquired during the game, during the very beginning of the turn, you will say, all right, I'm spinning a coal. And you'll hire your third worker temporarily for that round. So as long as you have coal, as long as you have your engine, you'll be able to get a third worker. Now there's different engines. This one will need two steel bars and on you can use this action on uh, worker action C, which is this. It will allow you to convert more resources into steel bars cheaper. So instead of needing three iron ore to get a steel bar, you only need two iron ore to get a steel bar. So that one makes it cheaper. This one says here, Take one build action after all build actions have been resolved. So this allows you to double your build actions, so to speak, because you usually can take one. But it costs two steel bars to get this one. This one uh, just gives you two coal, 
It's a cheaper way to get another worker. It doesn't give you any special power, so to speak. This one allows you during uh, worker action B that you can, uh, you're going to acquire rubble, sorry, remove rubble at the rate right here that it's at. It could be at anywhere from one to four, but if it's at four, for instance, and you take this action here to, to excavate, take this action to excavate, you look at the, the excavation worker rate, which is four currently, and then if you have this engine plus two, so you can remove six rubble. So that's why you might have this engine. Uh, because when you remove rubble from stations, you'll see that that's how you can get ownership. The first ones to remove rubbles from the stations, if I remove this four, for instance, I'll be able to put my ownership marker on there. So this train allows you to do it a lot quicker. So it's a, a, a desirable train. So this means that on worker placement step A, when you take this, you get to take three resources. Normally, this allows you to take plus one more, and it costs two steel bars. So, once you have your six, you place them out here to the side, and people will be able to purchase these later. By the way, why is this card sitting here off to the side, this card B? This card will be made available. This is another uh, build action. So you'll see that here's a normal B card, which allows you to excavate rubble. If during the course of the game, we removed all rubble from the uh, track cards and the stations all the way around, well, you won't be able to take the remove rubble action anymore. So instead, you'll replace it with this, and now you have another build action available. Because if you look here at the board, you have a you could take two build actions. One player can put it here, another player goes here, or if you're lucky, you can put both of your guys there. But now you have another one here when all rubble's removed, so another player can go there. So that's something to keep in mind as to what you do with this card. You only place it after you can't remove rubble anymore. So that goes off to the side. So let's take a look at where we're at now in the setup rules. So now we've got our six trains out of the seven. Uh, as recommended, we're using the SD cards. Now the stockyard and supply bag. Now these are the resources that you're going to need to convert to uh, develop stations and to get steel bars to buy engines. So let's take a look how that's set up. So right here, let me remove these. Depending on the number of players, uh, well, first off, I'm getting ahead of myself. It says right here you're going to need seven iron ore, four stone, and one coal. So here's seven iron ore. Five, uh, five stone, I have too many, co too many coal here. So here's all the other resources that are left. Now it's important to remember the counter mix here because if you take a uh, convert resources to convert rubble in the stone and there's no stone in the bag, you'll be able to look in the bag. If there's no stone in there, then you're not able to convert the rubble in the stone. So you've got to kind of remember the counter mix. These white cubes are for events, which I'll explain in a minute. So you put all the remaining iron ore, stone, coal, and the white event cubes in the bag after you've set it up right here. Now what I was pointing to here out of order is that at some point every turn you're going to add more resources to these to the supply uh, to the stockyard from the supply bag. depending on the number of players. So, now you'll see what these, you'll see some other things on the board here. This has to do with events. Here's the steel bars. Uh, let me move this back here. So now we have the game set up. So that was a little exhausting <laughs> to go through uh, all 15 steps, 
but hopefully I've saved you some time because it, it took for someone who's never played the game before and figuring out in this master set what cards to use in the just the context that oh I'm building a route I need to remove rubble to 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 build uh, tracks and we're developing stations to get points that helps with the context as to what am I doing here because uh, it's, it's it is a worker placement game but it's a little different in terms of the strategy because it's a construction worker placement game. All right, so now we're going to get into the how to play part. And the cool thing is that after you learn the rules, you can use these really nice player aids, which gives you the player sequence. And then you have the rules summary, which highlights, for instance, how they end the game. So let me give some context here of how the game ends first, which I'll look right here. So the last track is laid as a result of an event. I'll explain events in a minute. The game ends at the end of the, of the next round. So that means when the last track is laid, you finish the current round, and then you play one more round. Another way that the game can end is the player has laid the last track. Game ends at the end of the current round. So the differences between these two rules is an event can cause the track to be laid, but if a player does it, then the, cur the, end will, the current round will end. If an event does it, you'll finish your current round, but still play the next round. Now here's the third way it can end in a two-player game. In a two-player game, one player has uh, placed all of their ownership markers. Ownership markers, again, are gonna go when you lay track, and when you clear rubble from a station, and then you spend stone or steel bars to develop stations. So if a player has placed all 16 of their ownership markers, the game will end immediately. So that's that keyword immediately. So that gives you an idea how the game ends. Again, you're trying to get the most victory points. But because it's a, it's a race game, you don't, you're, uh, you're trying to do it as quick as possible, maximize your points, and hopefully mess up your opponent's plans. Uh, they might be going for something, and if you end the game prematurely, they won't be able to make it happen. All right, so let's take a look at the player sequence. I'll give you a quick little overview, and I'll go over each one in detail. So the first thing you're going to do is assign laborers. Now, when you look at this player aid here, the reason why these are here is that if you're playing with different scenarios, it's going to have special rules for those scenarios, which I haven't done yet. Then you're going to resolve actions in order, and that's where you do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, which is, you go in order right here. If there's a labor here on A, A will go first. If there's a one on C and nobody in between, C will go next. Then step three will be restock the contract cards, which is over here, which is going to affect the weather. Oh, by the way, I forgot you turn these over once you determine the weather. Then you're going to check the weather, which is going to affect the, the rubble removal rate and the lay track rate. It can go up or down depending on if it's raining or if it's sunny or you can't do it at all if there is fog. And I keep on knocking these over. All right. And then the last step of the round will be the restock the stockyard. And this is where you can draw the white event cubes, which I will explain here how that track works. So really the game is once you understand it, it flows really flows really well. The turns are quick. If you watch the how to play video, it goes very quick. And it, you, it has, makes you, makes you uh, have to plan out. It has nice, tense decisions. So now let's go in order of how this works. So assign labors is the first step. So when you assign labors, remember you're only going to start out with two. Eventually you'll be able to acquire an engine. Pay a coal if you have any to get a third laborer. So I'm going to model this right now for uh, two players. Player one 
has a choice to make if they go here to A. Either one's going to give three resources of their choice. They could take a combination of iron ore, stone, and the coal that, that starts here. So if they want to have first choice, they're going to take position A. However, if they want to have second choice and go first in the next round, they're going to put it here. So let's say, let me get the pink ones. The ones in the pub here you don't use, so I've got to remember that. And not to use the sur surveyor ones. So let's say green goes here. Does want to go stay the first player. Pink's like, no, you know what, I'm going to start excavating rubble right away. So there's two spots. So that means two workers can go there. It could be even from the same color. So pink could take this action twice if green doesn't take the other one. Now, there's no reason to take the second position card. I guess there is a reason if you hope that someone takes it first and you hope they remove some rubble and you can get access to the next rubble. Now, what does that mean? Because when you remove rubble, it's by the current rate. Right, right now, it's two. So I would want to go first to remove this rubble. Uh, well, maybe not. At some point, though, you want to remove, go first to be the last one to remove the rubble on a station card. Because if you do, you get to place one of your ownership markers here. So that's where the advanced planning comes into play of knowing how the weather is going to affect the next day or if you have an engine that affects uh, how much rubble you can remove or if you even have a contract which allows you to remove more rubble. So you'll see sometimes these cards right here in the middle will allow you to remove more rubble. So like this one right here it says whenever you take the excavation action this round remove double the number of rubble cubes. Now why is that important again? It's because if I can remove all the cubes from a station space I can put my ownership marker on there. But also if I'm planning on taking an excavation action and a lay track action here in D, I want to remove the rubble first and if I have steel bars I can remove the rubble it, it, and then flip it over and place my ownership marker on it and when I turn in a steel bar. So that's where the tension and the planning comes in is maybe I do want to go second on, on excavation and hope green goes first or maybe I want to go first and, and, st and make green go second. Or if you're playing in a three, four, or five player game, it can really affect things. All right, so green is going to convert the resources they get into steel bars or rubble into stone. And then uh, pink, we don't have steel bars yet. Pink could go here again and excavate more rubble. Go here and buy an engine, but it's not allowed yet. Or to develop a station, but it's not allowed yet because rubble has to be removed from all previous track route, track, uh, track cards, and from the station to develop it. Here, this is a very important space. F's, I mean, Pink's going to go here to get a contract, which let me take off picture in picture. They get a contract here. Or Pink can go here and move the surveyor up the mountain. And again, the more times you take this, as you saw, you can get up to 21 points all the way over here. So let's, let's say it's, they decide to take this action. So now, step two. Now we're going to resolve the actions in order from A through G and in order from uh, any spaces on those cards. If there's a one or a two, you also go in order as well. Oops. So, green, orange didn't, I mean, I'm sorry, pink didn't care about getting resources, so green takes off his laborer is going to take the, take the, uh, because he's going to want to convert it, he's going to take three iron ore. He could have taken the coal and the stone, but because he took the conversion action, he needs some iron ore to convert into a steel bar. So he'll place it in his area. Now we're going in order here. Pink uh, takes her laborer, looks here at the current excavation rubble rate of two, takes two off this card, places those two in her area and then later on can take the uh, C is called the works action convert that 
rubble and the stone. Again, why do you want to have stone? Because if you, if the station has been, the rubble has been removed, if you take the build action, which is on E here, so if you take the build action, you can convert stone you have. If I have four stone, I can put my ownership marker on there and get nine points. So that's where you take your rubble that you acquire during the game and convert it here on C. You can do this three times. So if I have six rubble, I can convert it to three stone. But I can do a combination. I can convert six iron ore to two steel bars and two rubble into one stone or any other combination. But you don't have to do all of it if, if you don't have enough resources. So back to what I was uh, showing here. So pink removed the two rubble, put it in her area. Now we're on to C here, which is the works. And you saw that green took three iron ore. Now it's going to convert that three iron ore to a steel bar. Again, why do you want these? Because you need steel bars. So you notice that this rubble has been removed. So green could take the, uh, the build action. I'm sorry, the uh, lay track option, which is D. Nobody took it this turn because nobody had steel uh, bars and then place their ownership marker and get two victory points for that. So he's planning ahead. Right now you don't flip it over because no one's done a, a steel bar yet. All right, so green's done their second labor action, goes back here. No one did the, the lay track action because no one had steel bars yet. No one's gonna be able to do the build action because you can't get the engine yet. You can get the engine when the second white event cube happens, which I'll explain here in a moment. Uh, oh, pink meant to go here to get a, con uh, a card. I put it on the surveyor action. So now we get to, to pink. Takes the uh, F action, looks at the three face-up cards here, can take any one of them. So let's take a look at each one. So pink says, wow, well I can swap weather disks if I don't want a certain event to happen. And if I can get two of my ownership cubes on a station and lay two, lay two tracks right in the game, I'll get 17 points. Here I can get a plus one lay track option during the D step. And if I am able to get five of my ownership markers on, a, on the stations anywhere on the board, I can get 15 points. Here I can immediately convert two rubble from your personal supply into one, into one stone up to three times. So, and if I have four rubble at the end of the game that I did not convert into stone, I'll get five victory points. So I think that because I'm not in a position yet. Pink's not in a position to lay tracks, but it's seven, I can get 15 points later. Let's do this one because uh, this is a really good card for the end of the game scoring. So, Pink takes this card. As to her area, at some point during, if she puts a laborer on the D, uh, space will announce, all right, I'm laying plus one tracks, rotates the card to show it's been used. So it can't be only be used once in the game. Now you can still get to the 15 points at the end of the game if she has the five ownership markers on stations. All right, so that is a progression of the resolving action, step two. We explain all the A, B, A through G. I mean, obviously, I, I kind of mentioned it already that if pink or green took the surveyor action, you move the surveyor up to the next station. Doesn't matter if there's rubble there or not, the surveyor can move ahead through the mountain regardless if the rubble's been cleared. Uh, one thing I need to mention that, uh, make sure I emphasize this, you cannot lay track until the rubble is removed. Seems obvious, right? You cannot develop a station until all the rubble is removed, nor skip ahead to the other lay track areas unless the rubble has been removed. The only exception is if an event comes up, which we're going to get to here in a moment. All right. 
So step three is to restock the contract cards. Now this is important because it's going to determine the weather. Whatever's in first position goes into the discard pile. This shifts down. Next card comes up. Next card comes up. Oh, we have sun now. So this shifts up. The sun is here. Now we know that the weather is going to change. But uh, yes, we know that the sun's going to happen, but we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you know how the depending on how many con we know one contract card is going to be removed, possibly two. So we don't know if it's going to be sunny still on the next day. If someone acquires one of these two cards and this goes up, that means the second card will be revealed, which we can't see. So that has some variability there, depending on, on if a contract card is purchased here and this is removed. But if no card is uh, bought or removed, we're still going to have some variability. We just don't know how many cards we're going to go through, I guess is what I'm trying to say. In a roundabout way, I guess I was kind of a waste of time to explain it. You still don't kind of know. You're looking right here at these indicators. So it's raining now. So that's four, check weather. So if there was already a weather disk on the exclamation space, on future turns, this would slide off and this would move up. But in the setup, it moved there, so now we know it's raining. We check here on this chart. When it's raining, you shift the laid track down minus one and the excavation down minus one. If, it, it, when it becomes sunny, we know we're gonna have two days of sun, it will shift up one, I mean two and one. The next day, it will shift up, that will slide off go up one, uh, two, you don't go beyond that, and that will go one, but we don't know what's following up behind it. But right now we do know that it's raining and we are not going to be able to work as well. But sun will be coming out and it will be sh shifting up pretty fast. And here's the contract cards for that uh, next day as well. The last step is to restock the stockyard. So we look here at this little chart and a one or two pair game, we draw six. So here I'm gonna draw six out. And if we get any white cubes, interesting things will start to happen. No white cubes, so I just place them here. Now if a white cube did come out, now I'm gonna go over the events. Eventually they're going to come out. If the, the first white cube that comes out, you see it's a shovel icon. You're going to remove as much rubble according to the current rate. So when it, now with it raining, there's only going to be one. So one will come off. Now you could draw uh, four white cubes at one and one draw. Next one is, oh, engines are available. When you get your second cube, now you keep these here. Now this is where I talked about that exception with the stations. The third one is the game is going to develop uh, tracks regardless of if rubble is removed as well. So this is where the tension comes in that maybe you were planning on, uh, okay, I got some steel bars. I want to take the lay track option next turn. And I, okay, I'm going to, you know, you all had your plans set up. But then the event happens and the game develops the tracks for you, ruining your plans. So let's say it, it was sunny. We've gone through two days of sun and it's, you know, it's up this far, four and, and two, because we've gone through two days of sun. And we drew this many uh, events. Well, first off, we move four rubble. Now we can develop, we can buy engines and it's going to let, and the game is going to develop two tracks. So these flip over. No one now can place their ownership markers on it. So we've lost our opportunity as players to lay tracks on that. Now, that can be an issue because on contract cards, let's say you were going for this card here, a really nice card, and you needed to lay five tracks. Well, if the game 
you'll see there's only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 possibilities to lay tracks. And other players are going to be going for this. So if the game lays those tracks for you and you needed those two tracks to get that five, now you can't complete that contract card. Instead, you might be going for this one now where you can only claim this one for one, one track for four points. So the game can really mess with your ability with events to complete contracts. Uh, now that exception I talked about, let's say this, these were already developed. And you got the, the lay tracked card, but the station rubble hadn't been removed yet. Well, the game doesn't care. You still remove the rubble from the next two according to the lay track rate. And they're developed. As players, we still need to remove the rubble from the station before and from this station over here before we can get to these to remove rubble. Now, how do the event cubes recycle? When you draw your fourth one, this is where a station gets closed off when you get on this spot. So let's say this was developed already. Green had removed the rubble from there first. Pink removed the rubble from there. Green had uh, used a, a, a build action to develop this and turned in four stone. But now this event comes up, this station is closed off from further development you can still develop the other stations that are further up in the line. So that accelerates things. Now when this, you see here, this symbol here, one, two, three, these come back off, they go back in the bag right here. Now what can happen further on is rubble is removed again. Here is if you own an engine, you must, at the time when that event comes up, turn in a steel bar or your engine is returned to the stock, uh, returned to the uh, engine yard. So you hope you have a uh, steel bar when that event happens. Again, seven, there will be four that will be here. You'll keep that here and recycle these back in the bag. Now, here's a rule that we haven't gotten to yet because it hasn't happened in the game we played in. But here, for ten, it will recycle over and over. Uh, it won't go back to position one. It will recycle over and over here. Uh, if you get to 10 and the game's not over yet, you take off the previous two, put it back in the bag, and start here on eight and eight again. You draw cubes again. I'm sorry, when you draw white cubes again, you place it on eight. By the way, you can only have one engine at a time. When you take the build action here, you can get a different engine if you want. You just return the engine that you currently have back to the engine uh, yard. All right, so that is the game, uh, the, tur the turn order, the actions you take with your laborers. Now let's talk about end game scoring. So an important part of end game scoring is you're gonna use a score pad. You're going to let me just put a few more things on here. First thing you're going to do, you're going to see here from the playthrough that we did. You're going to count your track ownership first. So you're going to go around the board. Don't remove your ownership uh, markers. So if I own these two, I'll have five points. Don't remove them yet. Then you do your station ownership next. Again, without removing them. I look out here, I have four. And nine, that's 13 points right here. So let me show the card up close. Because I had my markers on this and this, 13 points. Again, don't remove the markers yet. And I'll write that down right here. Then you look at your contracts. So if I had these three contracts, then this is when I'll start removing ownership markers. So if I laid a track, I'll put it here. If I had any leftover rubble, I need four rubble, according to the symbol here, four. Here I need two station markers, which I have. I did not have another 
uh, track, perhaps, and I ran out of rubble. So I can't complete this one. But here, I can't, so I'll get 4 and 5. So I would write down, even though it's different numbers here, I write down 4 and 5 and add them up. Then I look at if I had the 9 train, which is right here, if I had this, I'd put that down here. Then I look at where my surveyor is on the board, depending on the position the surveyor is at. If he's down here, it's 0. If I only got him here, it's worth 1 point. And then uh, I'll write that here. I add them all up. Now, if I'm playing different scenarios, I'd, I'd count for those points. Whoever has the most wins. Now, you'll see when we do the playthrough how we got these scores. So that's the, uh, how to play Snowdonia, the basic one. Uh, there's little rules that can come up with the contract cards, but there is a nice uh, explanation here in the rule book of how you read those right here. I think it's on the, yeah, it's also on the rules summary here as well. So that is Snowdonia, the Lux Master Set. Please take a, a moment to watch the playthrough and a review. And if you haven't seen the unboxing it, you can see all the great pieces this comes with. This is truly a master set. And if we get 100 likes on this video or on the other three videos, we'll do a, another series on the uh, expansions or the uh, scenarios that come with the game. If there's any rules that I forgot or that I misinterpreted, please let me know in the comments and I'll add it to the description. So I'm David, and this is RP Gamepire. Thank you for watching this video.